So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Vasilis Dacos. Uh, Vasilis is a biologist by training with his bachelor degree from Aristotelian Panepistimino Telasonikis, if I did it <laughs> correct, I don't know. It's the Aristotle University of Thess Thessaloniki in Greece. And then he earned his master's degree in hydrology and water quality management and his PhD degree in theoretical aquatic ecology both, both on the Wageningen University in, in the Netherlands. And before his current position, he was a postdoctoral researcher at ETH in Switzerland. Nowadays, Vasilis is a CNRS researcher in France at the Université de Montpellier. Uh, in his research, Vasilis is interested in understanding resilience and abrupt shifts in ecology and earth sciences, uh, developing tools to quantify uh, the risk of tipping points, analyzing statistical patterns in ecological environmental variables to uh, detect vulner vulnerability, and building fundamental bases, uh, or what we call theory, to integrate evolutionary process and ecological models uh, which have critical transitions in the system. Uh, so thank you very much, Vasilis, for accepting my invitation. It's a pleasure to have you here. And please, guys, help me to welcome Vasilis. <laughs> well, thank you, Flavia. <clears throat> I hope you can hear me well. Maybe. Yes, yes. Uh, wonderful. Um, well, I'm sorry for uh, having uh, uh, chosen to study in places that are very, very difficult to pronounce. Uh, I hope uh, the rest of our presentation will be more uh, un understandable. Uh, today I want to give you a little bit of an overview of the work I have been doing in the, the in the field of, um, of uh, critical transitions and uh, tipping points, words that uh, I guess some of you or maybe all of you have, have heard because um, uh, yeah, change slide, very difficult. Because um, <clears throat> I guess we, you have been, uh, uh, I guess you have been exposed uh, in the news with titles uh, in regards, for instance, in the climate that uh, there are, um, there is a potential issue that uh, some of the climate subsystems have been reaching or even crossing uh, tipping points. You may have heard um, about uh, the changes in biodiversity uh, that uh, might also be related to potential tipping points and uh, global mass extinctions. A system very familiar to you, um, I don't know if I can, rem maybe it's easier so you can see better my screen, I hope. A uh, system very familiar to you, the Amazon uh, forest uh, is very highly debated. Of course, uh, it's very clear its importance for the regulation of the, um, of the, of the climate uh, in terms of biodiversity richness, but also very interesting in terms of dynamics because again, there is this uh, very high a discussion and interest of whether uh, the, it may tip and we lose the forest get, turn into a savanna type of ecosystem. And, uh, and very lately we have be, even be hearing the word uh, tipping point in what it comes into the, the global pandemic that we all experienced. So it's a word that has gained a lot of, uh, of attention uh, a buzzword uh, in uh, in some sense, and uh, this is um, uh, a very interesting uh, uh, type of behavior that I have been studying uh, with uh, a lot of uh, other people in disciplines from climate to ecology or to to epidemics. And uh, I would like a little bit to uh, try to define a bit better what this tipping point actually mean, at least from my perspective. Uh, so to do this, I want to give you some examples that are not uh, current examples necessarily, but they can go uh, much uh, much uh, back in time. For instance, um, the Sahel, you know, the area around the, the Sahara region, 
hasn't been as we know it uh, today. So now we know that it's a desert system, but more than five to 6,000 years ago, it looked more like a savanna type of ecosystem, last with vegetation. But something happened and then the system suddenly changed from this configuration to a desert state configuration as we know it today. The climate, uh, as I told you, we have concerns about its current uh, state, uh, current and future state, but has never been stable either. Uh, we know that in the climate history is punctuated by abrupt uh, uh, changes. For example, here I show you the, the thermal land circulation, the system that brings warm water from the Gulf of Mexico up to the north coast of uh, Europe and the and, and the Americas. And it's a system that is very important for the stability of the climate as we know it, as we know it um, um, in, in the European region. Uh, but you see that more than uh, 12 or around 12,000 years ago, um, there was a relapse. This thermal land circulation collapsed. The temperature fell in a much, in a much more colder state. And likely for us, it reemerged back to a warm kind of state, uh, state and it remained constant throughout the last uh, thousands of years. Uh, there is an increased uh, concern that uh, this circulation uh, has, cr might, has even crossed uh, already uh, a potential threshold and that could potentially tip back to, to, to this uh, stopped state where actually it will stop circulating. Um, but coming much more in, in, uh, in scales that are more familiar to us, uh, uh, we know that uh, animal populations uh, can uh, have uh, bumps and bursts. This is a classical example of the Atlantic uh, cod, which in the, in the 90s underwent a very sudden uh, and abrupt uh, uh, collapse um, with some signs of recovery since then. Uh, but there are also other examples of some very iconic uh, ecosystems around the globe. You have been hearing a lot about um, uh, coral leaf bleaching and the threat of uh, uh, of, um, uh, of corals uh, uh, to corals by by climate change. For for coral reefs, we have quite an established um, um, uh, understanding that they can they can shift from uh, what it looks like a healthy coral dominated by dominated by actual corals into a degraded state where corals actually are getting overgrown by macroalgae. And this, too, this transition can, be, uh, can happen within, uh, with only few, within only a few years. Uh, I talked uh, to you already about the, um, the shift of, um, of forest, uh, of Amazon forest, potentially to, to savanna. You can see you have these extreme uh, contrasting states between different ecosystem types. And another example that is very close to my um, to my experience because I've been working as a, and studying aquatic ecology is the example of lakes, where lakes also the, they can uh, they can be found and they can they can shift they can uh, uh, change abruptly from a, a clear water state to a turbid water state due to uh, eutrophication eutrophication meaning the excess. Uh, a nutrient input uh, to a lake. So we have all these changes that are happening at different systems and across different scales. And the question is whether these are tipping points. Uh, because, um, and, and, and the second question that um, I'm, I, I would like to discuss with you and show you some work on is whether we can actually detect such um, uh, tipping points in advance because uh, for these types of systems, like we would, what what is um, what we would like to know, apart from understanding, you know, their dynamics and whether they can show this tipping point behavior, is whether we can actually, in practice, be able to to detect such uh, approaching tipping points in order to take mitigating mitigating actions, do something to prevent them, or if we cannot do that, at least to get ready uh, in advance in order to to adapt to them. So in, in my talk, I want to give you a little bit of, um, as, a, as I was saying, some, some basic uh, uh, definition of uh, what are all these uh, tipping point behaviors. So how do we define these tipping point responses? Then I will also theoretically show you, you know, like some examples of, uh, of ways that we could potentially detect these tipping points in advance. And this is what 
we would also call like an early warning uh, signal of uh, tipping point responses. And at the end, I want to show you some examples of how we can measure this type of signals in a much broader uh, broader scope. Uh, and I'll, 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 I hope you will understand later what, what I mean with, with that. So let's start with the basics. What are tipping points? So, uh, well, <clears throat> When somebody hears of a tipping point, you know, perhaps, you know, a picture like this comes into, into mind, you know, like a system uh, that um, is uh, becoming, you know, like a kind of fragile and perhaps even a small perturbation, you know, a small disturbance may be able to like to tip it from its current configuration to some alternative configuration. And... Um, and one can think, you know, like of this type of responses in, 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 in these terms. I hope you can see my, do you see my mouse? Yes, we do. You see my mouse, right? Yes. Okay, great. So it can be like in this configuration where you have environmental stress on the X axis and the Y axis, you have the state of your system. And then, you know, you can think that the tipping point is like, there's this threshold that suddenly, you know, your system changes quite a lot and comes into a different configuration. But uh, that's not what exactly we mean with tipping points because it's still kind of a gradual, like continuous response. We're more really thinking about this abrupt type of response where things are changing, stress is changing, but nothing really seems to happen. You know, like the, the, the response of the, of, the, of the state of the system is, is, is rather weak. But then we reach this point where suddenly, you know, we have this major change, major shift to this alternative configuration. Then this is what we would call, you know, like mathematically a catastrophic bifurcation or what is more in the, you know, like more uh, common literature uh, being referred to as a tipping point. And maybe you will hear, you know, like for the same type of, of, um, of, of uh, behavior, the words uh, catastrophic shift or critical transition or regime shift. But you see that uh, fundamentally the dynamics of, of this, of a tipping point or at least what I define as a tipping point is very different from a situation where you have this gradual response. And I'll come into, back into that, but first I can give you a sort of definition. Uh, we can define a tipping point as a situation where you will have some accelerating change that will be caused by a positive feedback that will move your system from its current state to a new state, to a new from its current configuration to a different configuration. And then, and this change has, has been is characterized by few properties. It's abrupt; it happens relatively fast. It's unexpected; that means that only small changes and small perturbations can lead to this tipping point response. And it's also substantial, so that's why it's called catastrophic. We're moving to a new state that is very different, it's fundamentally very different in in whatever properties from its pre previous configuration. Or like I showed you with the, with the Amazon, we go from a forest into a savanna type of ecosystem. Or with the climate, we go from a warm to a cold state. So in here in the words, uh, what is very important is the existence of this positive feedback. That's the mechanism that is, is, um, is necessary to propagate the system from its current state to this uh, different state. So um, a positive feedback is, a, in, in a way, it's, a, it's a, a mechanism that is destabilizing. It's contrary to a negative feedback. A, neg a negative feedback would mean that uh, when you have a change, there is a control in your system so that you're never trying to go away from where you are. These positive feedbacks can emerge in different ecosystems. And I want to give you an example of Salo Lake so that you can understand better how this positive feedback is related to a tipping point. So in a Salo Lake, there is a very strong connection between few elements in, in this, uh, in this uh, type of ecosystem. So, uh, so we, we have the macrophytes, that is aquatic vegetation, and then you have algae, you have these microscopic planktonic organisms that are also plants but they have a completely different life and life history. So these are actually plants with roots, whether these are like floating microscopic organisms. And they're competing for uh, nutrients and light, but there's a very, very strong um, uh, sequence of interaction. So the macrophytes are very uh, well adapted in removing nutrients from the, from the water column, but the nutrients are necessary for algae. So, when, so nutrients uh, allow the growth for algae. 
The algae now, because they live usually, they create dense mats and they live uh, usually higher in the water column, they also create shading. So they are shading the macrophytes and making life of the macrophytes difficult. Remember, macrophytes are plants, so they need light to, the, to live. So the algae have a positive effect on turbidity, that means bad light conditions, and bad light conditions has a negative effect on macrophytes. So you see, this, there's this arrow of sequence, which if you start multiplying, you know, like these signs, you will get what is called, you know, like this, uh, this positive feedback. So you have more macrophytes. This would mean there is less nutrient availability for, for algae, which means there will be less algae available. And if there are less algae present in the system, that means there is less turbidity. And less turbidity doesn't mean more light. So that's, that's very good for macrophytes. So the macrophytes will sustain their growth. Now, the thing is that because of this feedback, which works for in the, what, I, what I told you now in favor for the macrophytes and keeps them happy. If we assume that we have nutrient loading, that's eutrophication, so we have more nutrients available in the water. Now the nutrients are not anymore uh, limiting the algae because the macrophytes are not, there are just too many nutrients for the macrophytes to remove. So as the nutrients are becoming excessive, now the algae can grow. But if the algae grow, that means they can, they can make the water more turbid. More turbid water would mean suffering for macrophytes. Less macrophytes will mean more available nutrients because they don't absorb them. So more nutrients, more algae. And now you get the positive feedback that will shift your system from this macrophyte dominance to this algae dominance. And eventually it will make your lake look from a clear water state, that is where a lot of macrophytes are present. It will turn it into a turbid water state where a lot of algae are present. So you see this positive feedback is related to, is, is the mechanism that gives rise to this tipping point once the conditions, once the right, once the right conditions are met. Um, so interestingly enough, we can write some very relatively simple mathematical models that can describe this type of dynamics. And basically they are, when, when, uh, when we plot, when we analyze these models, we get responses that look like this line. So on the x-axis, we have environmental conditions. In our case, we'll have, uh, that's nutrient loading in the case of the lake. And the y-axis, we have the state of the ecosystem, which would be, in our case, the amount of aquatic vegetation, the, the amount of macrophytes in the lake. So you see that in these models, we have, first of all, we have these two lines, two black lines that correspond to the different equilibria. That means for a given environmental conditions, we can have either one equilibrium which, is, which means that we have low aquatic, low, low aquatic vegetation, or we can have an equilibrium with high aquatic vegetation. And these are the two um, alternative uh, states in our, they represent the two alternative states in our system, the clear water state and the turbid water state. You see that this presence of these two alternative uh, equilibria happens for a range of environmental conditions. And this is the range where we, we, what, that we call that our system can be bistable. That means for this range of conditions, we can find our system either in this configuration or in, or in this other configuration. Now, what happens is when we study tipping points is that we assume that we're starting from some kind of good environmental conditions, you know, like kind of low nutrient loading. So we're in this clear water state up, up on this uh, black branch. And as conditions are deteriorating, that means there's more and more nutrient loading, we slowly follow this line. And we follow this line until we reach this threshold, which is the tipping point where suddenly the upper branch, the existence of the, of the clear water state of the high macrophyte vegetation disappears and the system shifts abruptly to this turbid water state. So what I described to you, we can uh, uh, model it with this, uh, with a model which I don't show you the equations, but with a model that give rise to this type of behavior. Now, what, 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 what this model all tells us on top of that is that if we would like to reverse, if we would like to go back to our clear water state, the existence of this tipping point behavior is such that that reversal is not so evident. So in, a, in, a, in, a, in another case, you would assume that once we cross and we are here at this high nutrient loading, then we would reduce the nutrient loading as a, as, a, as a management action, and then we would come back the same way we came down. But no, once we have these tipping points, as I told you, this positive feedback 
works the other way around. So actually, this implies that in this particular model that we would need to reduce environmental conditions in a much lower threshold compared to the threshold where we first made the, the, the uh, when, when the, 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 the first tipping point occurred, to go to a second tipping point at a much lower nutrient uh, loading so that the system now will be in favor for the macrophytes and not for the, for the algae so that to have the recovery from the turbid state back to the clear water state. And this um, uh, phenomenon, which is called hysteresis, is very interesting because it implies that with systems with tipping points, they can be irreversibility. So in this, what I mean with this is like, it can be that we will never be able to reduce nutrient loading in such levels because we're just having too much nutrients and too much uh, uh, fertilizers uh, in our agricultural practices. In a similar way with the climate, it's not that we, if we would reduce CO2 to the level where, for instance, um, uh, the thermal line, sorry, uh, for, um, not CO2, but if we would reduce the, if we could reduce CO2 to reverse uh, the, the uh, temperature, to, to decrease temperature, we won't be able to restore some of our climatic systems because of the existence of these positive feedbacks that we mean we would need to reduce temperature to a much lower level. And that may be not be possible at all. That's why one, one, what's, that's why what makes tipping points very interesting is the fact that once they are crossed, coming back is not um, uh, evident or even possible. So maybe once things have happened, things are irreversible. That's what this model tells us. And um, so the funny thing or the or the the cool thing, maybe I would say, is like for 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 systems as diverse as lakes going up the, up all the way to the climate, we can have models that basically reproduce this type of behavior. So we can have you know some basic uh, minimal models that can reproduce this type of uh, bistability and uh, and tipping point responses, which immediately opens the question of okay if they if they all you know like have uh, the same underlying structure and the same underlying type of dynamics, maybe we can also find some commonalities in how we will be able to detect these tipping responses in advance. So I would like to pass to this second part where I would like to talk about whether that would be possible. I would like to, to also note in this model that what happens is that if you, <clears throat> when you are coming close to the, to, the, to, the, to the tipping point, there's something else that happens that I haven't talked to you about. I mean, I haven't talked to you what is this, dotted line here. So this dotted line here represents the threshold or the boundary between what is called the basin of attraction of either this upper state, the good state, or this lower state, the bad state. So that means that um, uh, if we have um, uh, some, if, if we start uh, our system for uh, uh, for, from uh, uh, a level of vegetation that is above this line, it will always end up in this good state. But if we start our system uh, from uh, a, a level of vegetation that starts from below this line, it will always end up in this bad state. So that means that if, uh, that, but that, so when we observe what happens between the distance of this of the of our actual state to this boundary, you see that the distance decreases. And then here, exactly the tipping point, it vanishes. There is no distance. So that means that if we are here, you know, like we would need a much stronger disturbance to from from our current good state to the boundary in order to shift it to the other to the other to the alternative state. So here now, I'm introducing another way of um, actually having a, a a tipping point response and a transition, not crossing the not reaching the, just the tipping point, but also you know pushing your system from its current state over this threshold. So there is like a second, you know, like type of tipping point, which is related to the second, uh, to, the, to, this, to the same model. Long story short, short, the question is, or maybe I will, maybe, yeah, first try to define this resilience. So the resilience is, is or what we actually in ecology call ecological resilience, is that magnitude of disturbance that the system can tolerate before shifting to an alternative state. And I'll, maybe I will give you this um, representation that would help you better understand what I, what I mean. Here on the, on, the, on the bottom, we have 
uh, the same um, figure as before, but uh, so this is the good state, and here's the bad state as a function of uh, environmental stress, environmental conditions. And you see, if we take, for instance, you know, like a part, uh, our, uh, an instant of our system at this level, at this uh, here, you will see that this, this good state equilibrium has a basin of attraction that is as big as that. So this is like the, um, this uh, hill uh, hilltop here is corresponds to this um, unstable dotted line that I, 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 this threshold, this boundary I talked to you before. And you see that as we move the conditions to approach the tipping point that we will see from the good state to the alternative state, you see that this basin of attraction, this valley shrinks and the distance to the threshold, you know, from the black ball to this hilltop decreases. So this is bigger, this is smaller, and when we're here it becomes very small. So that even uh, a small disturbance can now uh, uh, shift us and push us to the alternative state, to the bad state. And of course, when we cross the tipping point, this basin of attraction disappears and we can only have the, 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 the bad state. So what I'm trying to say, long story short, is like that this model tells us that as we are approaching the tipping point, this resilience, this capacity to absorb uh, disturbance and stay unchanged decreases. And if we were able to measure it, then we will get some kind of, of understanding of how close we are to a tipping point. So we can translate that measurement into a type of indicator that will tell us whether we, are, we have a higher risk of reaching a tipping point, either reaching the actual bifurcation, the point here that after that we will shift to the alternative state, or, or saying whether it will be more easy for us to tip from this state over the other based on crossing this unstable uh, boundary. So the question going back to this previous figure is like if we have if we have a situation that is like far and with uh, with high resilience and a situation where we are close with low resilience can we measure this difference between the two and say something about our proximity to the tipping point and our risk of potentially you know like shifting to the alternative state So in other words uh, uh, we uh, whether we can quantify this resilience. And um, that uh, seems so far kind of a straightforward question <laughs> uh, because if we would have the model for any of the systems, then we would uh, know more or less where we are in this, uh, uh, along these environmental conditions, right? And then we could derive this, um, uh, this function and we could measure this distance and uh, answer this question. But the problem is that things are not uh, so uh, so easy. So we can write this type, so I want to make here a distinction that we can write these models that qualitatively describe the behavior of our systems, but they are not uh, able to quantitatively give, give us predictions and actual uh, 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 measurable uh, quantities. So, uh, so what uh, I'm trying here is like, I want to make the bridge from qualitative models that are very powerful mechanistically and we can understand their processes and, uh, and analyze their dynamical behaviors into some practical quantitative tools because we are lacking the actual qualitative models. Hope, I hope this is clear and something that maybe we can discuss later. So, how to, so what do we do? Well, uh, the good news is that um, uh, again, based on some very um, fundamental mathematical theory, we know it's mathematically proven that when we have systems that are approaching this type of uh, uh, tipping points, this type of, uh, of, uh, of, of thresholds, their dynamics start to slow down. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with this uh, cartoon. So you have the roadrunner and you have the coyote and the coyote is always trying to catch the roadrunner. There's always this classical scene where the coyote goes to the edge of the cliff and then the, sorry, the roadrunner goes to the edge of the cliff, stops and then the coyote comes, but then passes over, doesn't stop in time and it's over the cliff. And then, but then when it's over the cliff, it doesn't immediately fall down. But there is this kind of, you know, inertia, this, this kind of, of moment where 
everything slows down before crashing down to the abyss. And that's what also our systems are doing. And the thing is that we can take advantage of that, of that slowing down effect, the fact that the dynamics are much slower when you are approaching these tipping points, that to, to help us to, de to devise um, uh, indicators that we could potentially use as proxies of loss of resilience or even as early warnings to approaching tipping points. So the first thing that happens, it's a straightforward uh, translation of that slowing down effect is that if we are far from tipping and we imagine that we monitoring our system and then we introduce a disturbance uh, manually, for instance, we go and we remove vegetation uh, from our lake, we see that the, the system will bounce back. It will bounce back much faster compared to a situation where we are closer to the tipping point. This is a bouncing back much slower. So we can measure this as a recovery time increase. So if we have this type of experiments, then we can measure uh, the, the difference in recovery time, and we can say that this situation refers to, to, a, to a case where we are closer to a tipping point compared to this situation. The second thing that uh, happens is, is that um, the variance in our system will increase. If we don't have this strong disturbance, but we have these continuous disturbances in our system, like we have this stochasticity, which is present in any natural system, and we just measure and we just measure you know, the dynamics of our system, we see that the variability is much smaller when we're far from tipping compared to where close to tipping. And the third thing is uh, that um, memory in our system rises. That means that today, this is the state of the system today, starts, it starts to look more and more like tomorrow. This is the system of, of uh, the, the state of our system tomorrow. So you see when you're closer to the tipping point, you see that the values of today and tomorrow start to line up along the one-to-one -one line. So they start to become very similar. But when you're far from the tipping point, you see this cloud means that actually there is very strong, very, very little correlation between today and tomorrow. And we can quantify this, this memory effect as a rise in autocorrelation. So we have three things. We have recovery time, increase in variability, and increase in autocorrelation that could, we could use as uh, indicators or early warnings to approaching tipping points. So I want to give you one example and uh, some discrimination. So, I mean, we can use this first one, but for this one, it's, it's, a, direct, um, it's, a, it's a direct method. That means that we need this type of, of what is called in ecology, uh, pulse <clears throat> disturbance experiment. We need this disturbance in order to measure the change in recovery time. And we try to show that um, whether this would work in experimentally, we used the phytoplankton, uh, not in a lake, but uh, in, a, in the lab. Uh, and plankton, as I told you, is a, is a, is a plant, so it, need, it needs light to, uh, to, to survive. But when, you get, when it's exposed to too much light, then you also get what is called the photoinhibition. So it's, it's, the light is too much and the, and the plankton population may collapse. So this is what we try to see if it works in the, in, the, in the lab. We actually created this tipping point behavior. We have on the x-axis the light intensity. And on the y-axis, we have the, the, the density uh, of, uh, uh, of, the, of the phytoplankton population, which was growing in this device, which is called uh, a chemostat. You see here we, we increased the, the light population was doing fine until a, a threshold where it just you know collapsed and you see that uh, hysteresis effect that irreversibility that I was talking about this uh, this difference between the path forward and the path backward when we try to restore the population we had to reduce light much more than the light, than the threshold at which the population collapsed in order to have have it recover so we established that there is kind of a or that what we, we know from theoretically and empirically that there is a, like a tipping point response. And then we wanted to see if along this path, we could measure this slowing down effect, you know, like we could measure this uh, um, indicator of, uh, of approaching uh, tipping. So we repeated the experiment. We increased the light over the course of 30 days. And along this trajectory, we imposed these six disturbances. What we did was we diluted, we removed the, 
part of the of the of the population, and then we the population recovered. You see, and we measured this recovery recovery time. Actually, we measured the recovery rate, how fast it was recovering. And the expectation was that the closer we are to the collapse, the recovery would be lower. And indeed, that's what we found. These are the recovery rates of this five of these six disturbances. And you see that as we as light was increasing and we're getting closer to the tipping point, the rate of the recovery rate was becoming uh, uh, lower, which means that indeed that slowing down effect close to this tipping point in the system is is present. So it was like a demonstration that what we were um, theoretically uh, been uh, predicting it could work. So the second um, family of indicators is. Um, uh, is what we, uh, uh, I would call more indirect because they rely on, on long-term monitoring data. And uh, I'll give you an example of how, uh, or at least one of the first studies where, where we saw that actually it could work. And for this, we used the climate data just for the sim sim simple reason that when we did this study back in 2008, um, uh, it Ecological records were just too short to perform this type of statistical analysis. So, so the, the, the system I'm talking about is the thermal line circulation, and then we use paleo records, so sediment cores where you can reconstruct uh, the climate in, in, uh, in the past. And this is you know, the record that we got. So you see that there's uh, around uh, 2,000 years ago, you have this shutdown of the thermal line circulation. And what we were interested in was to see, okay, if we, could, if we could concentrate only in the part of the time series before anything happened. So here is the, the, the gray bar. You forget what happens after the gray bar. We only concentrate on this part. You wouldn't say that something is going to happen, right? Because it just seems that it's kind of stable. It's kind of moving along a horizontal line. But instead, if you look at how autocorrelation, one of these properties that I described to you, you know, changes. So we measure the correlation in this window, and then we move, and then we plot it, the, the window, and we plot it. Sorry, we plot it the correlation down here. Then we move this window all the way to the to the to the tipping point, all the way to the transition. And you see that autocorrelation, noisy, yes, but on average, it had a positive uh, trend. So autocorrelation was rising in this record, implying this kind of slowing down effect which is a fingerprint of an approaching uh, a tipping point. So it was very, very, very interesting to show that at least we didn't prove that, but at least that we, we showed that it, it possibly uh, slowing down could appear in this type of, uh, of systems at these global scales that can be measured for these records, of the, from these reconstructed records from sediment cores. So all this was uh, <clears throat> happened um, more than ten years ago that we summarized in this in this review, and since then, that's uh, that's not like a literature a, a search that comes to the present. But you see, there's a kind of a, an increase of interest in this type of indicators that they they go beyond ecology and climate to engineering, medicine, and social systems with a lot of. Uh, of uh, methods and 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 applications, uh, if you are interested, um, um, and I'll show you also some applications of, of my own. So let's talk about this last part of okay, how can we or how, what how are you we using uh, so at the at the moment uh, this type of idea? So to go back, I told you about a little bit. Uh, uh, a reminder: we have these three indicators: we have this recovery rate or recovery time have variance on the correlation. And uh, as a function of time or as a function of some type of stress, but the thing is that we are mostly actually, at the moment, we are mostly interested in that because these are, are derived from uh, from observations, whether these, as I told you, require some type of experiment, which it's difficult to experiment with big systems uh, at and large scales. And basically, we use them for three things. We use them to monitor changing resilience within a system. So that's actually the idea of the early warnings. So we can see how things are changing over time and say, okay, we're going, things are increasing, so we're going to the wrong direction. But also we can measure it across space. So we can map resilience uh, around different systems in space and try to identify um, uh, places where it seem to be more or less resilient in order to make some ranking and, and uh, use this ranking to set priorities for conservation, mitigation, or adaptation management. 
So I'll give you an example of how this can be done in terms of monitoring uh, cases. Um, but unfortunately, I'm not going. I'm going. I'm going to use a forest example, and I'm not going to use. I'm going, going to show you something that actually happened in real time because we are far from that. But but in retrospect, so we have this uh, example in California where we have these dying trees um, uh, happening, and what uh, these uh, authors did was uh, through remote sensing data, so data that you collect uh, uh, from satellites on uh, uh, on a daily basis. Uh, if you can reconstruct the, the a proxy of a forest cover, which is called uh, NDVI. That's a vegetation index that represents more or less, you know, the the uh, the abundance or the density or the cover of a forest uh, on a given area. And so these are the dynamics of uh, NDVI. And what uh, what happened is like here at the end of the record there was this like massive uh, dying out of forest. But when you see the record, I, also you don't see much happening. But if uh, <clears throat> you're going to measure, like I showed you before in the climate example, how autocorrelation of this record changes over time, the, these authors showed that uh, already, uh, you know, a few years before the actual events you know, that happened at the, at the, at the end of the, of the record, where you have this massive uh, mortality and dying out of trees, already before, you know, a few years before, you see that uh, the autocorrelation in your system was exceeding some threshold that was set by what was the usual autocorrelation in the past part of your system. So this, is, this could be, of course, as I told you, this was not happening in real time, but as a demonstration that we don't see anything from the actual record, but if we look at these properties and how they change over time, they give us some signals of potential loss of resilience and approach to a tipping point event. In this case, it would be a, a mass mortality of forest. What is more common is to look at, uh, at uh, changes in resilience uh, across space um, uh, to do some uh, mapping and, and ranking. So for this, I will show you again uh, a similar example, uh, or again comes from from forest, from forest dynamics, uh, uh, at the global scale, where again we use the uh, the same index, the same proxy of uh, of vegetation, but looking only at forest ecosystems, not any type of vegetation. And you see, we have a coverage now of around twenty years. And this doesn't seem a lot, but uh, it's massive in terms of what we had before. So actually, we can run this type of analysis using um, a monthly uh, resolution. So what uh, I'm going to show you now is uh, changes, uh, the trend in autocorrelation uh, over this period across the globe for forest ecosystems. So when you do this, you get a picture like this, uh, red dots or red colors in the map would represent places where autocorrelation has increased, whereas uh, blue colors or uh, green colors would represent uh, places where autocorrelation decreased. So the idea is like where the more red that you have a loss, you expect to have a loss in resilience, the more uh, blue or green you expect to have uh, a gain in, in resilience. As you see, you know, some things pop out, you see like in the Amazon, area you have these uh, uh, hot spots of um, of, uh, of increase of the correlation also in the boreal forest uh, in Siberia parts of of um, uh, Indochina and uh, sub-saharan uh, Africa so places where indeed there are some also independent expectations of things happening so this is like a demonstration of how we can use uh, these tools at global scale to try to to map potential changes in resilience and set some priorities uh, and also some understanding of what drives this type of, of changes. And, uh, uh, and for example, what we can do, you know, with this data is like trying to understand better what's happening is like we can, we can plot this, uh, the, their resilience or their change in resilience as a function of uh, precipitation and temperature. We know that forests, you know, are dependent on the need water and uh, temperature is also very important for them. So we can see, you know, perhaps, you know, under which ranges of uh, rain uh, availability and uh, temperature conditions, you get more or less uh, um, uh, uh, higher, stronger or weaker 
responses in resilience. For example, you can see that uh, for higher temperature and for higher uh, precipitation regions, it seems that the resilience is lost, uh, uh, has been lost more compared to regions where temperature is, is lower and precipitation is lower, where resilience actually seems to uh, present the opposite pattern, that is, that this forest uh, ecosystems are actually increasing in resilience. These are what I saw to use, it's a very, very recent work and uh, data that uh, are still, you know, like need um, uh, much more uh, understanding and, and digging in, but it's just like it's the first exploration of um, of uh, an, an application quantification of the tools that I described to you at, at global scales for very important ecosystems. And uh, I want to finish my my talk with another example where I'm going to shift and from forest and talking about drylands, and uh, where we where I, I want to show you per se the application of this type of of signals, although we can do the same. Uh, or, and we have done the same type of, of analysis for drylands rather than for forests, looking at changes in resilience. But actually, I will show you uh, uh, that we can also directly look at uh, the occurrence of, uh, of abrupt uh, changes in, uh, in dryland dynamics that could potentially be linked to, to tipping points. So I just, uh, what I mean is like uh, when, when we record an abrupt change uh, or, um, over time, this can be indicative of, of a tipping point, but not, not necessarily. Abrupt changes can also occur because of other reasons. But now we have the data again to start looking at the prevalence of these abrupt changes and eventually like to look for mechanisms and evidence whether they are related to actual tipping points. So drylands, the word is obvious. These are places where it doesn't rain, rain enough. And they're very important because they cover uh, quite uh, uh, a part of the of the Earth's surface. But most importantly, there's a lot of people who, who live on them and whose livelihood um, depends on them. And of course, in this map, what I show you is like there is a range of, uh, of um, what is a dry land, depending on the, on the area of the actual availability of water in these places. So you can have places that are very arid compared to places that are less arid. But there's a lot of interest in these systems because of, of uh, the importance for, for humans, and especially poor, poor people who live, mostly live in this type of, 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 of areas. So again, we analyzed the dynamics using this NDVI proxy. And what we did <clears throat> was basically that we had, you know, like uh, time, uh, the, the, uh, the data that looked like this. So we have like different trajectories of NDVI over time, and we try to classify them in the type of uh, their shape. So we either have, you know, uh, linear trajectories, or we have, you know, like trajectories that they were kind of stable, or trajectories that they were changing in uh, like quadratic, like nonlinear way. But also we were interested, or mostly we were interested in this, in this type of, of, of shape, this step shape, which would mean an abrupt change, which, which, which could be uh, linked to a tipping point response that I was uh, describing you earlier in my talk. So we did this in, we classified this type of trajectories for more than 41,000 pixels. So that's one square kilometer uh, uh, dryland, uh, patch of dryland, which represents 97% of the total dryland area on earth. <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to show you what, what we found uh, based on this classification, what we found was first that uh, uh, in most cases, uh, more than 50% of, uh, of these uh, patches, uh, we didn't find any change. That's what we called neutral. It was like stable dynamics. You could, you know, like things were not changing so much over time. But what was very interesting that in cases where either we had a positive uh, uh, change in, in vegetation or a negative change in, in vegetation, the majority, more than 50% of this type of, 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 of their trajectories happened in an abrupt way, which means that more than, more than 50%, we have this kind of a step behavior that could be linked to the existence of uh, perhaps a tipping point because of the crossing of some uh, threshold. And here, you know, like here, these maps are just showing, uh, you know, like where specially distributed are these, um, are these patches. 
So again, this is not proof that we're actually having a tipping point response, but because we know of mechanisms of tipping points that are related to drylands, gives kind of a starting um, uh, uh, point for uh, for uh, trying to to see you know which uh, in which of these areas these transitions potentially are uh, tipping point related and perhaps you know like much more difficult to to reverse because of the uh, of what I described to you earlier because of that inherent difficulty in uh, and uh, potential irreversibility of tipping point responses. And uh, once you have, uh, you know, you're doing this analysis like this, uh, you can ask uh, questions of what drives uh, this type of dynamics. And this is just to, since I know that you are, your pro, your your program talks about, you know, like quantifying things and uh, you know, like uh, uh, being more uh, quantitative uh, in, um, in 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 the methods you are you are using. Once we can have, you know, like when we can describe this pattern, see that the resilient changes or the, um, the types of trajectories at these big scales where we have a lot of available data, then we can start to look for relationships um, in terms of what drives, what parameters, what drivers would be important for describing this type of, of patterns. And again, it's a, it's a, it's a, a pattern-based approach, um, mean, meaning that we use some some drivers that we know that are important, but we don't have very clear expectations and hypotheses of how these uh, um, <clears throat> these uh, drivers, these uh, parameters, will affect our uh, uh, the patterns that we are measuring. Uh, and uh, very uh, uh, um, here, for instance, here we used uh, more than thirteen uh, uh, of these type of drivers, and uh, what is has becoming very. Uh, very popular and probably you have heard in your program is like using machine learning approaches where you have some some models that uh, <clears throat> in an informative or in an informative way they try to make sense of uh, different relationships between um, some input parameters and some output parameters and here particularly we use these random forest techniques to try to see if we can use these drivers to classify either this positive or negative abrupt uh, changes and uh, you get, uh, don't want to go into the detail of what we found, but just to show you that uh, if, when you do this type of work, you can, you know, like kind of rank uh, these, um, uh, these drivers in terms of their importance for, uh, for trying to classify either negative or abrupt changes. So try to understand. So, so you can say, for instance, that these uh, parameters here uh, seem to be uh, more important for uh, uh, defining a negative abrupt change and these ones for positive abrupt change. I won't go too much into that, but just want to give you a flavor that we can go from also from this, from this monitoring, mapping and ranking. We can also, you know, like use these powerful techniques when we have a lot of data to try to get some, some understanding. And it's an iterative process, but because once we get this understanding, then we can go back to our models which I told you that they are qualitative and not informative, but we can make them more quali less qualitative and more informative and perhaps more, more quantitative eventually. So it's an iterative process of uh, going from the models to have some expectations of what to find in our patterns that we analyze and using the patterns to go back to the models and understand something more about the processes. It's a hard... Uh, Hard work, hard cycle, but now we're getting, you know, like more and more data uh, to be able to uh, to do that, and more and more understanding for for some of these systems. And I think with this, I would like to to conclude. I hope there is some time for questions, and I hope I hope uh, um, uh, it was clear uh, and interesting what I described to you today. Thank you very much. I think we have some minutes for questions, right, Vasilis? Yeah, yeah, I can stay another 10 minutes for sure. OK. Uh, any questions, guys? Mike, can you pass the mic for her? Yes. They, they need to make the question on the mic. That's why it takes some time. No problem, no problem. She's coming from the back there. It's a very good camera we have here. But yeah, she's <laughs> saying hi. Hi. OK. Um, Hello. 
I I was just impressed. This is this is such a great work that you're doing. I was just <laughs> But let's go to the question. Um, there in the, can you go back a few, uh, a few slides? I think it's the last one that you've shown with the, yeah, that's what, that that one. Um, I was wondering, you're using NDVI as a parameter there, and you're, it, from what I understood, it drives some of the change. But I was thinking uh, the NDVI is also influenced by many of the other, uh, like rainfall will uh, change NDVI because it will change productivity. And I was just wondering how do you kind of like separate that productivity in like rainfall? I don't know if I was clear, but. I think I, think I understand your question and uh, I'm impressed by the fact that you were you picked that up uh, from this because that was not uh, my intention to go so much into the methods. But um, okay, so, short answer, this type of approaches, this type of regression models, or at least some family of machine learning regression uh, models, um, have inherent the capacity to uh, correct for correlations on your input variables. So your question, if I understand correctly, is that there, are, there is some correlation between the, the drivers that we're using here. So how can we find, you know, what is the direct effect of each one to our response variable? And, this, and the answer is that if that was the question, that the, um, these models take that into account. Any other question, guys? Here in the front. Oh my God, we have many. I have to manage them. <laughs> uh, first, Paula, then Gabi, and then Kamer, okay? Oh, Chifuni, sorry. <laughs> uh, hello, I'm not sure if you can see me. <laughs> yes. Uh, my name is Paula. Uh, I was curious uh, exactly about that same, uh, that same graph because I was interested about the part about positive abrupt changes. And I wanted to understand better what means mean temperature of the driest quarter, which is the most important one. I wanted to hear a bit more about it. So we, uh, <clears throat> so this we, we, for for every for every pixel because these are globally distributed. Uh, we, we, we cut it in quarters of the year, so different seasons. And, uh, and then for the, for the, this is, so th this is how we estimate it. So the, then we used, uh, the mean temperature of the waters of the wettest quarter. And th so that's how we did it. Okay. It's clear. Yes, so yes. why we chose this? Why we chose this uh, is um, because there is, um, like my colleague, uh, Miguel Verdujo, who is, uh, this is a, uh, yeah, it sounds weird, <laughs> but it is um, uh, a variable that uh, appears to be uh, important for drylands. So like the choice of this, uh, for the majority of these uh, drivers, these are based on uh, on literature and on expert knowledge because my colleague is a is a dryland ecologist, and some of them, some others, we we just um, because we have the data, you know, like we we do, we actually they were we analyzed more than this, we just uh, added them in the model, so you know, like that whether you know is is it is it in the same way you have the mean temperature of the driest qu quarter, so you know, like we try to look so you have temperature, and you can do mean temperature over the whole period, you can do, you know, like maximum temperature, you can go, do variability in temperature, uh, you can do, you know, like uh, skewness in temperature, you know, different statistics of that metric or, or the, the average temperature of the, of the driest uh, part of the year, of the wettest part of the year. So we try to play with uh, as many as possible. I know that's not a very satisfactory answer, but uh, it's, it's, it's partly, you know, like digging around by trying to look at different, uh, you know, kind of uh, um, attributes of, uh, of climate 
not just mean or variance, which is like the most simpler, and uh, some expert uh, and the literature knowledge. I see. Thank you very much. It was very informative. Um, hi, my name is Tiffany. First of all, uh, thank you for your presentation. It was very impressive. And I would like to know how you interact with govern governmental decisions using your research. Because no matter, um, <laughs> I'm a little nervous. OK. It's good. Go ahead, Tiffany. <laughs> Because no matter how much scientists show a possible catastrophe approaching, I have the impression that the interests of capitalism are always ahead of everything. Um, I agree with you. It's um, at the end, uh, not, not only for what I described to you, but you know, like for for other types of. Uh, of uh, of systems you know like um, from the from the management of, a, of of an epidemic or a pandemic like the like covid you know from the management of, of poverty or you know like uh, the management of biodiversity laws uh, there we, we don't need to we don't need to show more evidence that uh, things are not going or the the amazon is di dies back i mean it's, it's kind of or climate change is happening you know it's like the it's it's a political issue. It's re it's really political, and um, we we have in our in our group we have um, some uh, we we try to discuss this, you know, like and try to 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 think with the uh, with the members of our lab, like uh, what 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 can you do, you know, what is the other um, uh, avenue of action? Because okay, we published this work. We know we communicate it to some agencies. You know, so these are are these available, or we write reports. You know, these IPCC reports and the biodiversity reports, and uh, and we're actually now in the process of writing a tipping point state report. So, like, trying to say that things are more uh, you know like uh, sensitive because we have this potential tipping points which have these properties that I described to you that make all these changes even more dangerous and we have to you know act or prepare for them or you know like take them into account but at the end of the day it's it's a political thing so I don't have unfortunately a good answer uh, for, uh, for you what we mostly are as scientists are doing is like we are we are just communicating our results some of us are are uh, more engaged you know, like in their in social movements or they're trying to be part of the political process. You know, they try to talk to politicians and uh, with governments, but there's very few because we don't, we're not really trained uh, so much for that, unfortunately. It's, uh, it's something that uh, it's, uh, it's a very, it's a, it's a very true, uh, uh, very true what you're saying. But um, yeah, we are, we are thinking that there is this wise manager that you know will uh, do this, uh, you know, like in a magic way. But uh, at least you know, like you know, and and also you know, on the other hand, uh, I have to say that we perhaps something that we can do more as a scientist. We can be perhaps more more affirmative, you know, because everything I even I presented to you, I use probably a lot of uh, might, may, could, you know, like. Because I'm, I'm, you have this lens of the science scientist that uh, you know that's not proof. I told you that's not. We didn't prove anything, but it's kind of a evidence that that points. You know, maybe to, when you talk to managers, I think if you start talking like this, they 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 get they get you a little bit less uh, serious. It's different if you say this is going to happen because that's what they they want. You know, they want strict numbers and thresholds and and. But of course, you cannot. You don't have. You can't give them uh, um, that certainty. Sorry, that was a very long answer to just say to you that uh, you're absolutely right. Any of these research is uh, is uh, is make people people uh, people are are using it more, even in the political domain. They use resilience a lot and early warnings and tipping points. 
but it doesn't translate into more action. Just that it becomes more part of their jargon, you know, as if they're adapting it, but you don't really see things moving faster, unfortunately. Thank you so much. Um, You're welcome. We have just one last question. Do you think you have time, Vasilis? Yeah, 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 yeah. Shoot, shoot. It's okay. I can take a few more, no problem. You know, I can stay five uh, minutes longer. It's this guy um, over there in the hi. corner. <laughs> I don't know if you can see me, but hi, Vasilis. Yes. My name is Kamer. Um, thank you Hello. for your, your great talk. Um, my question is related to the ways that you show us on how to quantify resilience of a given system. And I was thinking about um, Brazilian cloud forests, which are, which are pretty neglected formations, so they aren't monitored in any, any way. And I guess that they are big enough to uh, make inviolable to make any kind of disturbance experiment. So what can be done in these cases where we don't have data or we can't perform any experiment? Hmm. So we don't have data and we can't perform experiments. Yeah, but we, we know that the system is like pretty neglected and threatened, so it, c it could be approximating a tipping point. So is there any way, indirect way, w that we can assess that? <clears throat> well, it's. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> you 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 always need to start from. I mean, there are, there are always some data, right? There are always some observations, and uh, and perhaps you know the first step is to, um, at least from the existing observations and from the existing uh, knowledge about the mechanisms for a system that is not as much studied, um, you can uh, uh, develop uh, some models like the ones I showed you before, these very simple lines. These are based on quite, quite simple models, but they're all, uh, you know, like uh, derived from some processes that we know about a few of these systems. So that's, uh, that's the first step because by building some models and by examining, you know, like um, their behavior, then you can, um, you can find some, uh, you, you can see whether, you know, like your systems have a capacity for specific responses that you are you maybe you would you don't expect. So it doesn't mean that if you put uh, any model, it will give you a tipping point. You know any process if you build any model with the process that you know it doesn't mean that will always have tipping points. No, no, they, you, you don't. Or maybe you will find out that you can get tipping points, but in a parameter space that is very limited. So that means that it's very improbable that you will end up in this parameter combination to get you know, like uh, tipping point responses. So that's like a, 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 a first step for, for a system where you don't know so much or you can't uh, collect so much data, or you can't do experiments, to at least map their potential behavior and then try to, uh, to, to gather data to, uh, to really kind of test your uh, hypothesis from, from the model you develop. Okay, that's great, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Vasilis. Uh, can you listen to me? Yes, I guess. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you very much for uh, being here. I'm so sorry for the confusion of time zones. <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, it worked at the end, so no problem. Yeah. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for accepting my invitation. I hope we can uh, meet it some other day, uh, personally, <laughs> not virtually. That would, that would be nice indeed. <laughs> that was a very nice uh, talk to, to the students. Thank you so much. So let's thank him. Thank you. Thank you, Flavio. Thank you. Thank you all the students. And uh, I wish you, you know, like good luck and good continuation with your studies. And if you need uh, to contact me or, you know, like whatever, you know, uh, my info is there, so just uh, don't, don't, don't be shy. Just do it. Oh, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.